Hello, and welcome to the Foreign Press Center's briefing on U.S. strategy on global women's economic security. My name is Zina Wolfington, and I'm the moderator for today's briefing. Joining us today are Assistant to the President and Director of the White House Gender Policy Council, Jennifer Klein, and Acting Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues, Kat Fodovat. And now for the ground rules. This briefing is on the record. We will post the transcript and video of this briefing later today on our website at fpc.state.gov. Please make sure that your Zoom profile has your full name and the media outlet you represent. Each of our briefers will now give brief opening remarks and then we will open it up for questions. We will start with Jennifer Klein, followed by Kat Fotovat. Over to you, Director Klein. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here today. It's my pleasure to discuss with you the U.S. strategy on global women's economic security that Secretary Blinken, Administrator Power, Acting Ambassador Fotovat, and I launched at the State Department earlier today. This first ever strategy is grounded in the wealth of evidence that advancing women's participation promotes economic prosperity and stability, and it addresses the significant persisting gender gaps in economic security that remain. Studies show that closing gender gaps in the workforce could add between 12 and $28 trillion in global GDP over a decade. And expanding access for women to markets and finance fosters entrepreneurship and innovation, with estimates suggesting that gender parity in, in entrepreneurship could add between five to $6 trillion in net value to the global economy. Yet despite the clear benefits of women's economic participation, too often social, legal, and financial barriers remain. We know that on average, women spend more than twice the amount of time than men do performing unpaid care work, and that the annual value of this work is approximately $11 trillion globally. We also recognize that 2.4 billion working age women still face legal obstacles to their full economic participation and that dismantling these, these systemic barriers is necessary to unlock economic gains. And we also know that the COVID-19 pandemic has had a disproportionate effect on women's employment with devastating effects on families, communities, and economies. The strategy on global women's economic security that we issued today will advance women's economic participation as a key strategic objective of our domestic and foreign policy. The strategy lays out a, an ambitious agenda to advance women's economic security globally with four areas of focus. First, promoting economic competitiveness and reducing wage gaps through well-paying quality jobs. Second, advancing care infrastructure and valuing domestic work. Third, promoting entrepreneurship and financial and digital inclusion, including through trade and investment. And fourth, dismantling systemic barriers to women's equitable participation in the economy. A critical example of our commitment to advancing women's economic security globally is our investment in the Gender Equity and Equality Action Fund, which we announced at the UN Generation Equality Forum in Paris. Today, at the launch event back at the State Department, we le released a fact sheet on the fund's work to date. This fund is specifically dedicated to promoting economic security for women and girls by increasing their access to resources, services, and leadership opportunities, and by addressing the barriers that limit their ability to participate fully in the economy. The fund invests in local and civil society partners around the world, prioritizing programs that address the disproportionate impact of COVID-19, climate change, conflict, and crisis on women and girls. Through this fund, the U.S. government has supported vital projects across the globe that advance women's economic security. To give just a few examples, including investments in child care infrastructure in low and middle income countries, support for women's economic resilience in Afghanistan, promoting access to green jobs in Kenya and South Africa, strengthening regional networks for business women in Eastern Europe, and supporting women's access to sustainable value chains in Latin America, to just name a few examples. The strategy we launched today is the product of close collaboration among 12 US departments and agencies and was informed by consultations with over 200 civil society actors and external stakeholders from more than 30 countries. 
As we turn to the next important part, which is the implementation of this new strategy, we will continue to rely on collaboration both within and outside of the U.S. government to achieve our shared vision of women's full and equitable participation in the global economy. We look forward to working with partners around the world, um, with departments and agencies as they develop their action plans over the next six months to implement the strategy. Thank you, and now going to turn it to Acting Ambassador Fodovat. Thank you so much. And my sincere thanks to Director Klein just for her incredible leadership at the White House Gender Policy Council. I want to also thank um, all the journalists today for being here, for helping to amplify this important strategy launch um, and make sure that women's economic security is something that is prioritized throughout the world. As Secretary Blinken said this morning, we're putting forward this has been a heart simple ver vision to create a world in which all women and girls can contribute to and benefit from economic growth and global prosperity. Advancing this agenda is not just the morally upstanding thing to do, it's the rising tide that lifts all of our boats. The strategy was assiduously developed and will be just as diligently implemented by no less than 12 U.S. government agencies and departments. It's a truly whole of government approach. The Department of State for our part, we'll focus on our diplomatic engagement with the G20, G7, OECD, APEC, as well as in other multilateral and bilateral engagements, advancing our policies and programmatic priorities. As host to APEC this year, we intend on placing a heavy emphasis on women's economic security as a catalyst and ensure that for economic growth and strength and prosperity worldwide, that women and girls will be included. We are looking forward to engaging with Japan as they chair the G7 and India as they host the G20, ensuring that elements of this strategy are in integrated throughout 2023, all of our policy and planning priorities. Bilaterally, we continue to work with counterparts from other governments, encouraging them to adopt our recommendations as they develop their own domestic and global strategies for women's economic empowerment and security. Finally, and most importantly, we will continue to engage the private sector, civil society, academia, and women on the ground to work hand in hand with us, inform us of our activities, and help us as we develop our State Department action plan and to implement this historic strategy. As I always say, nothing about them without them. Thank you. We look forward to your questions. Thank you for the remarks. We will now open for Q&A. For journalists in the briefing room, please raise your hand if you have a question. If called upon, please wait for the microphone so that everyone online can hear your question and kindly identify yourself with your name and outlet. For journalists joining us online, please raise your hand using the raise hand button and turn on your camera so our briefer can see you. Um, I see we have a question from um, Ibtisam Azam. Please unmute yourself. Uh, th thank you. Uh, my name is Ibtisam Azam from Al Arabi Al Jadid uh, newspaper. So, my question is uh, to Ms. Klein. Um, and it's about trade and which role do you see that trade uh, should play in women, women economic empowerment? And the second part of the question is uh, also about, um, you talked about uh, the importance of and the advantage of uh, benefits for women uh, participation in the economy. And uh, if you could uh, give us um, or say more to the challenges you believe that the U.S. Uh, is facing uh, in this issue, especially when it comes to working uh, women and women of color. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, in answer to your first question about trade, um, trade, the United States Trade Representative was one of the 12 agencies that I think we both actually referenced um, were part of the development of the strategy, which also included, in addition to the State Department, USAID, the um, Development Finance Corporation, really uh, the, the Peace Corps, um, the Inter-American Foundation, a, a very broad range of agencies. Um, and the reason that uh, that uh, USTR was at the table 
um, and the Department of Commerce as well was because trade is at the center of this as well. Um, we, we see, um, as we've also just uh, referenced, it not only is, um, is women's economic empowerment important to women and their families, but it's important to the global economy. So everything that we do in the strategy as we begin to implement it will have both of those pieces in mind. What's important for a, a person who, um, and I'll get to your second part of your question, a person who um, wants to, to work to support her, her family or herself, but also um, the implications in the global economy for, for the US, but really for, for every country around the world. So yes, trade is extremely important uh, and integral to this strategy. On your second question, you know, I think one of the things that I've noticed, um, I didn't uh, speak about it, but the, the Gender Policy Council is both domestic and global. And as we have um, collectively lived through um, the last several years with COVID, uh, uh, major economic turmoil around the world, what has um, become obvious uh, to, to me is uh, that there are many challenges that we are facing, which while the context is very different, the challenges are the same. So as you think about you know, access to good jobs, which is core to this strategy, when you think about um, the care economy and the, the pieces that people need to be able to both take care of their, themselves and their families, whether that's child care for, for a young child or home uh, and community-based care for a, a, an elderly or disabled relative, um, you know, all of these pieces need to be in place for people to be able to fully participate in their economy and in turn for, for economic uh, development uh, and prosperity and stability to, to exist in the world. Um, and then to the, to the last part of your question about, you know, particularly for, for women of color, um, you know, again, what, what is true in the United States is really true around the world, which is that um, we have not succeeded unless the most marginalized, the most historically excluded have an equitable opportunity to participate. And again, so core to this strategy and really all of the work that we do um, throughout the United States government on women's economic participation will include a focus on how we make sure that everybody is at the table, both in making the decisions, um, our policy decisions, but also, you know, core to um, to the policies that we, we make. So as I said, that everybody has a, a chance to participate fully and fairly. Thank you. Next question goes to Sandra Miller. Can you hear me? Hello, I'm yes. uh, Eleanor Brody, and thank you for having us. Uh, I have two questions for you. Um, I would like to have some detail about uh, what you say about Europe. You speak about that you help uh, in Africa uh, about uh, green uh, Europe of East. Can you detail and Europe in particular, in particular, because I'm French. And the second fact, the second question I wanted to uh, to ask you. Um, do you uh, plan to like uh, to organize a communication campaign? Because uh, for me, I think uh, maybe sometimes there is a lot of good initiative in the United States, but sometimes we don't see them enough, you know, so we are here to write an article, obviously, but do you uh, plan to like, uh, I don't know, organize a campaign uh, to make your action public? Thank you. So I will attempt to answer the first question regarding some of the work that we are doing globally um, and specifically in Europe. Actually, we just launched um, a program called We Champs. Um, what we're seeking to do in a program such as WeChamp is really connect women globally in terms of women's chambers of commerce, women's networks, making sure to look at the global digital divide, finding ways to um, increase markets for women. So certainly um, in Europe and, and in Eastern Europe specifically where we're starting the pilot, pilot work that we're doing there, um, you know, we're looking at opportunities to make sure that um, the women entrepreneurs in specific countries have the ability to connect not not only within their own countries, but regionally and globally. So we're looking for mentorship opportunities, training opportunities, and creating platforms for them to be able to have those markets, which we know that the global inter, uh, internet structure 
um, really is a way to help market some of their products and be able to um, sell services. So finding ways to connect those various um, um, in integrated networks is really what that program is about. Um, and so we're looking at that, um, uh, including in Africa, including in um, Asia. So really having that regional approach and then expanding that globally as well. And I'm not sure I heard your second question. Um, I think it was about um, what we're doing to make uh, the, the um, strategy more publicly known and available. Yeah. Is that essentially campaign. what you asked? It was about communication campaign, uh, Geo, like, uh, because of how people uh, in the world can know what to do, you know, how can they do so. Do you really organize a campaign, a communication campaign, advertising or something? for connecting people to your initiative, to what you will uh, do? Yes, and so um, in addition to obviously you should get your hands on the strategy um, itself, which has a lot of information in it. Um, in, pre in preparation of the strategy, as I mentioned earlier, we worked with a vast number of external stakeholders um, and we will be doing so as we implement the strategy. So making sure that everybody's ideas are included as we implement the strategy and also importantly, as you said, to make sure that people are aware of what's in it the United States government is aiming to do in collaboration with other countries, with partners, with civil society. Um, and we really want to make sure that people know, um, for, first of all, how to access the resources that we are making available, whether those are the women on the ground, as Kat has said, or other governments or multilateral organizations. So yes, there will be a, an effort to make sure that people know that these words on paper are, are meant to be more than words on paper, um, but in fact, an entire plan and whole of government approach to, uh, to advance women's economic security. Um, I'll, I don't see any hands raised, just one, all right, please. Hi, uh, I'm Ryohei Takagi from Kyodo News, Japan's news agency. Uh, think, thanks for briefing today. Uh, I have a questions for both of you. Uh, as, as you mentioned here, this uh, strategy, brand new started strategy has a, has a bunch of information and a bunch of uh, principles. And then I think the, each one of them would be the very important and significant. But if you choose one, uh, what is the uh, what, is the, uh, what is the most significant principle or uh, uh, commitment? That is my first question. And the second one is, the, uh, uh, what is the biggest challenge uh, in the United States uh, right now on uh, gender equality and gender uh, equity issues? Thank you. Um. Uh, I actually start with your, your second question first, which is, um, I think the, uh, it's a hard question, I think the, the greatest challenge is um, that we um, have made a lot of progress. I mean, one of the things that I have focused my career on is looking um, at where there has been progress and where there needs to be additional progress. And while I think we have made progress in some areas, um, the economy is actually one area where I think there has been um, less progress than there needs to be, um, th more things in, in the United States, uh, issues of, of health and education. Historically, we've seen uh, greater participation, greater progress, um, less participation, I mean less progress when it comes to economic participation and political participation. I think that's true in the United States and, and around the world. Um, and. But, but what I think we've seen in the United States this year is, for example, we can't necessarily count on the progress that we've made, that you know, it's sort of a, a constant effort to, to move forward. So to take the obvious example, um, last year in 2022, the Supreme Court overturned a historic precedent um, that um, guaranteed the right to reproductive freedom in this country that had existed for nearly 50 years. Um, so I think while we have seen tremendous progress, um, we are sort of always needing to remain vigilant to, to steps that may be taken um, to, to go backward. Um, which is why I think, first of all, the existence of a, of a strategy like this, and, and one thing that we didn't mention earlier is that you know, when the president um, created the Gender Policy Council, which I'm privileged to lead, 
Um, he also asked us to create a national gender equity and equality strategy, um, which is broader. Uh, it, it actually includes 10 strategic priorities. I think that speaks to sort of the challenges that remain ahead, but also the opportunities. Um, so I think um, it's, a, it's a broad answer to your question, but I think that um, that you know one of the challenges that we we are facing in this country but also around the world is you know post the pandemic um and as i said you know some the the real economic challenges that the world is facing um we we still have challenges uh in in you know the the things that we've already made progress on so that's the more challenging uh the the the, the downside i i saved the the first uh, question because I think you know the the priorities that are identified in this strategy you know Secretary Blinken said it Kat repeated it um, just now is the reason this strategy makes sense and the reason this strategy I think will really have a tremendous impact is because it is um, is addressing things that are not only the right thing to do you know this is about women's rights to participate uh, people of all genders to participate in their economy and their society but it's really, uh, you know, makes good economic sense as well. Um, and so I think that sort of the, the four priorities that have been identified that are in the strategy really speak to all of the pieces that are needed to make sure that somebody can fully participate. And that will have benefits for um, not only th those individuals, their families, their communities, but for the economy as a whole, both the domestic economy and the global economy. Thank you. This concludes our Q&A session. I want to give a special thanks to our briefing, briefers for sharing their time with us today and to those of you who participated. Thank you and good day.